Tuesday, October 23rd, 2024. And we will now do our call to order and our roll call. Uh, Stacy, do you mind doing roll call? Not at all. Happy to do so. Chair Simaconda? Present. Commissioner Becker? Present. Commissioner Dorman? Present. Commissioner Eisenberg is absent. Commissioner Purrington? Present. Commissioner Randall? I am here. Good morning, everyone. Commissioner Smith is also absent. Uh, Laura Smith has actually resigned. Has, yes, that, has that been accepted? I haven't actually. We're working through that. OK, so that's the intent. Okay. Recommended protocol for our, our members and other participants. All commissioners should have their microphones on mute to keep the background noise out of the chat room. The chair of the meeting should ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak if they would like. Commissioners should use the chat function to inform the chair that they would like to, a state, to make a statement and the chair or Stacy will announce the commissioners to speak in the order they appear in the chat. Public participation. We cannot, the commission cannot act on items presented during the public participation portion of the agenda. Individual commission members may ask questions of the public but are prohibited by open meeting laws from discussing or considering the item among themselves until the item is officially placed on the agenda. Each public comment or presentation will be limited to five minutes. All right, moving on to our discussion items. Um, Ada, I believe you are doing the presentation on our Flagstaff Regional Plan 2045. Is that right? Actually, um, Chair, that's going to be Sarah Dector, our Comprehensive and Neighborhood Planning Manager, who's here in person. And I'll let you introduce Elsa as well. Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone who's online see the slide on the screen? Yes, we can. I just want to make sure first. Hi, I'm Sarah Dector. I'm the Comprehensive and Neighborhood Planning Manager. I work in community development and I've been the project lead on the long range plan for the city, which is called the Flagstaff Regional Plan. And with me today is Elsa. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Elsa Erling. I'm the Associate Planner in Comprehensive Planning, working with Sarah on the Regional Plan. So thank you for having us today. Um, I think we have last visited with you all about a year and a half ago, so I'm not sure how many of the commission members were here or have turned over. So I'm I'm going to give a little background on what the regional plan is, and then talk specifically about what issues the regional plan discusses that are pertinent to um, the the in, the inclusion and adaptive living commission. Um, this is a very broad document. It goes beyond the city limits, so. I think that is important to acknowledge that this is a partnership we have in our planning efforts for land uses and transportation and infrastructure with Coconino County. And this box, which you know is right along this square, is basically what is called the Metro Plan region. So that's the region that the federal government uses for transportation funding that goes to what it calls Flagstaff. Um, and this area is where two thirds of all residents of Coconino County live. So the Flagstaff is about half of all the residents in Coconino County, and then it takes you up to almost two thirds. And by 24 or five, it'll probably be three quarters of all the people who live in Coconino County will live in this region. Um, so it's a very important place. And we have this great partnership with the county to make sure we are coordinated in all of these efforts associated with development. This is my new planning pyramid. If you've seen the old one, I used to put it on my slides and tell people it was my favorite slide, and, and I've made it a little more complex. But the regional plan is a foundational document. It covers broad overarching direction for a, broad, a very big set of city and county activities. Um, and for, for the planning and development side, it includes area and community plans like the Southside Community Plan or the La Plaza Vieja Community Plan. And as you know, those can be really instrumental in seeing accessibility improvements um, move forward and get grant funding. So for instance, the Butler Avenue complete street improvements that have funding and Martin has been working on with the engineering staff that concept came from a neighborhood plan and from a land use plan that the city did with that community. 
Um, ultimately, also the plan is referenced often when we are updating engineering standards, the zoning ordinance and the fire codes and building safety codes. Of the, that gives them the why of why we make changes to our codes and how we use them to um, bring forward better community development as time goes on. But we also use this document very informally. It's cited in staff reports and the budget process. Um, there's strategic plans that the city has and master plans like the utilities master plan, the active transportation plan, the housing plan for 10 year housing affordability um, and the carbon neutrality planners, because some of the most commonly cited examples. Those are not plans that are directly used in the review of zoning map amendments and annexations, but they are linked to how the plan is drawing a bigger vision for the entire community. So that's some of the ways we use this plan and why it's important. This is a project that has been going on for about two years. We've been working with the community through a number of different efforts that I'll go over a little bit. Um, but we basically broke this process into four phases. And phase one, we didn't really have a plan yet. We have the current plan. We got really curious. We came to this and other commissions and did a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat assessment of the current plan. We visited with a lot of community organizations and asked them what they needed the plan to do in the future. And then we got really busy working with a consultant called Cascadia Partners, who helped us build a collaborative process that included ambassador level outreach to hard to reach populations and also um, did scenario planning, which helped us test ideas and see what could actually help improve outcomes for the community in 2045, which is our target year for this plan. Um, the stage we are on now, though, is we have had for the last nine months a committee that has been meeting and reviewing chapters and potential material for the plan, and they have endorsed a draft that is now available for a 60 day public review. Um, and uh, that is really the key of why we're here now. And so committees and commissions and councils and boards are now able to look at this plan cover to cover. I am happy to report it's 100 pages shorter than the last plan and it has fewer and I hope clearer goals and policies. Um, so that is hopefully encourages everyone to look at it. A key reason we want commissions to look at it is there's still room for change. I kind of think of this as like the 60% plans, like it, if you were thinking of like an engineering document. We would like feedback so that we can improve the document. It will eventually go to the City Council and the Board of Supervisors and the Planning and Zoning Commissions for adoption. And there are several steps between here and there. But basically, by looking at this now and providing us comments, you are getting a voice in what shows up on next year's ballot. And that is something Stacy and I get to work on in the next cycle of budget and requests and other things is that this will go in a ballot and city of Flagstaff residents will get to vote it up or down directly. And that's part of phase four. So here is some members of our regional plan committee. You may recognize some of these um, brave folks who met with us for nine months over 15 meetings that were at least three to four hours long, including all the time they spent between meetings. So if you run into anyone who's been part of the committee, please make sure you thank them because they put in a lot of service in a very short period of time. And I know you as commission members know the value of this kind of volunteerism in the community. Um, our meetings have, were open to the public and they wrapped up in September. Um, that group went through a lot of discussion. All the videos of all the meetings are online. So if you want to open up the transportation meeting and see what they talked about when the transportation chapter was reviewed, that is the kind of homework anyone can do. And it's all available on the project website at this time. Um, the focus of the plan, and we really tried to create a prioritized and focused draft plan is these five priorities. Um, and they probably won't surprise you because they are the five priorities we've been hearing about at city council meetings and in every uh, opinion survey we've done in the last two years. These are really things that significant portions of the community are concerned about and want us to work with. We've refined them a little bit um, to make sure that they are taking into account a broad variety of voices. So like while lots of people might bring up housing affordability, 
there are specific neighborhoods that are vulnerable to displacement in the community who said, we love affordability, we know we need more housing supply, but we can't displace people in the name of getting more housing. So we listen to those voices, especially when people felt that they, some of these potential goals could also be threats to their portion of the community or people who they represent. So we had um, a lot of discussion about how this would look. Um, we want to make sure that the whole plan helps us move towards these priorities without having a lot of conflicting direction. And this is kind of how we set the bar on what we wanted to move forward as a committee and staff. The plan is organized a little differently than our current plan. If you're the kind of person who loves a wonky policy document and you've popped that open before, um, you'll see it has topical chapters and then each chapter has goals and policies. This document has two sections. The policy section has just the goals and policies with pretty minimal introduction and then the growth and land use framework. And the reason these are separated is because these are the key pieces that apply to development cases or the right side of that pyramid that I showed you earlier. Um, the implementation section is really the left side of the pyramid. It's all the other things that staff and our partners and the county are doing to move forward these goals and policies. Um, and that they might be principles we follow or they might be like actions we need to take. So we broke these into two sections so it became much clearer what parts of the plan apply to what kind of decision making. So the policy section looks a lot like what you see in the current plan. It has goals, policies, and land use categories and descriptions of what can or can't be done in those land use categories. Um, and that's it. those are the basic building blocks of the plan, essentially. They help us review development cases, they help us update the zoning code, they help us know if we're achieving the right outcomes when we make those kinds of changes. The implementation section has guidelines. So that really tells staff about best practices. Like what is it we are trying to do and how are we gonna achieve goals and policies? And then it has action items. And we didn't have any action items or strategies in the current plan, even though it's required to by state statute, because the city council elected not to do that. And I think the reason that I have been told that happened was so many strategies were brought forward, like over 300, that they just looked at it as an overwhelming list that could not possibly be done in 10 years, and they basically took it out of the document. So we took that lesson and applied a different strategy and said, let's figure out what has to be done for this plan to be implemented, what really has got to move forward. And that helped us narrow down our action items to 23 high priority action items and about 80 other action items that we think it would be great to get to, but no, might be a lesser priority. And 23 action items feels like a, a five-year program pretty easily, like for five to seven years, if we are working as a team at the city and we're working with the budgeting staff and we're working with council, that feels like achievable in under 10 years. And I think that will make us more successful at having the, the council under and planning zoning commission feel this is an implementable plan. Um, the good thing about action items is we could add more. We could take some of those other ones and move them up if the opportunity arises. And we can also, add things to it or do things that are not currently listed in the plan to see it implemented. So I think when we change the mindset about what that looks like, we're going to provide the community something that can is going to be more acceptable. The other two distinctions that are key and different from our current plan is the current plan has like 30 maps in it, but doesn't do a good job of telling you which of these maps are just telling you about existing conditions and which ones are actually giving you direction or setting policy. So we broke the maps into two pieces. There are six policy maps that actually like set the policy. Where will we be building foots trails? Where will we be allowing certain land uses? What does the future road network look like? Where are areas of future parks and open space needs? And then there are a lot of other maps that are required, but they're really just there to provide you context and information. And so those are distinctively called out so we can be clear on that as well. We actually got to this plan not just by having a series of unorganized public meetings, but this was a very deliberative process called scenario planning. And we engaged in what's called exploratory scenario planning, which means we looked at critical uncertainties. 
and then we tested those against potential futures. So critical uncertainties that we looked at were this is the first time that the city of Flagstaff's potential population curves as produced by the state office of economic opportunity have shown three distinct scenarios, which are we could be shrinking as a community by 2045. We could be on a stable growth path or we could be on an accelerated growth path. And the number one reason is migration. Migration in the era of climate change is going to be vastly less predictable and we have a low birth rate and a, and a rapidly rising death rate. So our population growth, which we've seen very steady since the 1950s, is not assured for the next 20 years. So we played around with that. We played around the, if that meant we would have lots of funding and there's things like the infrastructure act making opportunities available to us to improve infrastructure, or maybe there's not much funding because of this declining population. We also included what the breadth of were in a community setting um, and called uh, the, the growth scenario workshops and people are face the future workshops and people got a chance to sit in the driver's seat and try and have these conversations, which then generated growth ideas. And then we refined into distinct scenarios. Um, the one scenario I want to talk about besides the preferred scenario, which is what we built the plan off of, is the business as usual scenario. We actually modeled this time what would it look like if Flagstaff just played by the rules on the books for the next 20 years? Like we don't, do we not, do we need change is kind of the purpose of having that. Like what if we kept all the zoning code rules the same way, we kept all the same uh, conservation rules, we just kind of kept moving in the direction we have been moving. And what it told us is that is going to be very bad for our community, which it's important to know, like, cause there's a clear assumption people make that the way, because something has been yielding benefits, that it will just continue to yield benefits. But that is not true. We are we are in a situation where uh, the pivot we make now will have very long lasting impacts to the community. What these scenarios showed us was that continuing with the development patterns we have now and the mostly single family zoning that we have on the books throughout the city will make us 54% more expensive to live in than today in terms of housing costs, where if we can pivot to a multifamily um, attached style of housing that we've got in some places in our community um, and provide that in places where we already have infrastructure rather than just relying on only new neighborhoods to provide new housing, we could decrease our cost of living by 20%. And that has a real impact on how far people have to travel for work and a lot of other quality of life issues that are really important to everyone who lives in Flagstaff. We also found that compared to our current scenario, which um, the business as usual scenario would increase um, commuting by automobile and reduce walking and biking, that we could reverse those trends by also thinking in a same development pattern. So this is why we call this a land use plan. And, that word was part of the title of this document in 2001, and we took it out. Now we're putting it at, back in because these land use decisions can have this level of impact on many of the other goals like active transportation that we have for the community. So how do we get there? We have this thing in the plan called the future growth illustration. And our current one, if you look at it, is very soft and it is kind of like indistinct boundaries this is a very parcel specific map now. So if you own property or you live somewhere and you have a neighborhood that you care about in the community, you need to look at this map in detail because at the parcel level, we are drawing lines on what kind of future zoning requests we will accept, what kind of changes and in infrastructure we will plan for the community in the future. And um, what you can see is this is the purple color on this map is urban centers, corridors, and neighborhoods. The yellow color is suburban. Suburban is broken into two categories. One is higher density and one is medium density. The pinkish color is rural. The blue is the employment districts of um, university and research districts and employment areas. And then the green areas are both parks and open space and also federal lands and working landscapes. And that's a new category to this plan because we needed to acknowledge that there are lands that are being conserved and 
a different way than the way a park is managed. Um, we also have a rule in Arizona that's been added since the last plan that says we cannot designate any private or state land as parks and open space unless we have written property owner permission to do so. So that limited where we could display parks. Um, and we wanted to also acknowledge that there's conservation work going on even in maybe landscapes that are being managed for multiple uses. So we have some goals around housing that I think are important for this commission to consider. Um, I know you've had some involvement in the 10-year housing plan, but we really are driving, that is a big thing driving this plan as well, that we maximize affordable housing in every neighborhood to meet the housing needs of the region and that we not just be concentrating um, housing for affordability in certain areas that we be working to minimize and mitigate displacement of residents and prevent the loss of existing affordable housing. So we know that displacement disproportionately impacts people who uh, have different abilities than people who are, you know, uh, more able-bodied and we don't, and might have less financial support in some ways. So that's, this is really important. It's, it's a part of the plan we don't talk about now. It is also a challenging part of the plan because we have somewhat limited government capacity to address displacement. So a lot of this will rely on our ability to negotiate and leverage our resources and work to, um, to build partnerships that help us achieve this. It's not just something we can regulate into existence, of, and it is a challenging part. Um, we also want to work with all the local service providers to provide the needs for daily needs of people and temporary shelter and transitional housing for people experiencing homelessness. On the transportation side, we have several sections that talk about our transportation system overall, our multimodal transportation needs, transit, and then for the city in particular, we talk about streetscapes and parking. And streetscapes and parking are where we run into a lot of our issues with meeting ADA and even exceeding ADA um, standards so that we are achieving both a landscape and streetscape that is enjoyable for the community, but also meets the needs of everyone who's trying to use the landscape. Um, we talk in the transportation systems and transit about lane narrowing and traffic calming and road diets. This is not something that was heavily emphasized in the current transportation plan. Um, and also the need for safe systems approaches and to prioritize vulnerable road users. I know this language mirrors what ADOT has just adopted in their highway safety plan that they've just put out this week. Um, it's pretty close to the language we're using in our guidelines for the transportation chapter. So that shows we're in good alignment with the federal policies and with the state policies, which hopefully will help us find funding for many of these improvements. Um, Sarah, Fair enough. just interrupt real quick. Sure. Rachel's got her hand up. Oh, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Would you explain what traffic calming and road diet means? Sure. So traffic calming is when we add features to the road, like, I don't know if you've seen what they, for the last year or two, but it can be like an island or what they call a bump out, which is like an area on the edge that narrows intersections. It can also be speed humps, which we don't do a lot of because we do a lot of snow clearing in the winter. It's not Public Works favorite solution, but it can also be things like on Fremont Boulevard, how they painted the road with an artistic um, effort at street calming, and it actually slows people down. But I mean, they're all efforts to bring visual cues to a road that help drivers slow down and therefore reduce the severity and frequency of pedestrian and cyclist accidents with vehicles. So in in expanding on that a little bit, what has been discussed or what will be discussed about ADA accessibility? Because we've done two audit walks. We did one last year and then we just did one on October 5th. And uh, there was some pretty significant ADA stuff going on with a lot of the roads around here. Right. I think Martin just put something in the chat. Martin, did you want to maybe speak to what you just posted in there? 
I, I can, thank you. Uh, Martin Entz, uh, Multimodal Transportation Planner. It's just, it's just uh, I did a quick Google search for Traffic Calming 101 um, and, then, and then dropped a link from the Project for Public Spaces in the chat so you can kind of see what traffic calming is intended to do and what are some of the um, uh, techniques for getting there. Thank you. Yeah, that's quite related. Yeah, well, it, it maybe maybe a visual will help people more too. Um, but so the 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 ADA issues when we do traffic calming studies on roads um, are always included in how that design happens. Um, not every road get, has gotten traffic calming on it. Usually, the way uh, Martin can speak to this too, the transportation staff does this work right now, is they get a complaint and they go out and do a study to see if it warrants traffic calming. The Metro plan and the city are working on a streets master plan um, that is really going to create more opportunities for these kinds of changes to, to the community roadways and this language in the plan is what will be used to guide that conversation like they will be looking at these guidelines versus the detailed work that they'll do in the streets master plan and say are we meeting those guidelines are we moving these objectives forward by changing the way we're designing roads and they're still working on the scoping step and i know it'll be this probably will be adopted next year if we stay on track as a plan and then I think you would see a streets plan that actually implements it more broadly in the community two to three years later. But the, the overall piece of the that there are mechanisms to do these kinds of improvements now, they're just piecemeal there. We have a complaint, we have an issue here, and they work neighborhood by neighborhood on specific roads. Um, those aren't always tied to ADA issues or um, that that they're aware of, but they when they are happening, they also include an ADA evaluation. So I think part of my concern with all of that is, I, I think, and I may be out of line, but I think that this commission needs to be involved in some of that. You know, we've got almost every member, commission member here is either disabled or knows someone who is disabled. And we have the voice that can make possibly bring um, focus to things that you guys could easily adapt for us. So uh, we have asked before to be included in those things. Is it possible for us to get invitations to those? Uh, Martin and I can certainly bring that to the team working on that. Martin's in the same staff as the um, people who are starting to work on scoping this. Okay, and I know Martin is a huge advocate for this commission, so I'm not so worried about it, but I think that one, at least one of us, possibly two of us, would really like to be involved and possibly just be able to voice things. So, um, and then I did see Russ, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you, Rachel. And I completely agree with Rachel on that. Um, the city has completed some projects in the very recent past in which we were not consulted until after the projects were actually initiated. And uh, and we have seen projects completed that have decreased accessibility um, in our city, which is really just kind of going the wrong way. So um, we would absolutely like to be involved um, in some of those planning phase, you know, during the planning phase before the projects are initiated. Well, I think too, as far as reviewing this document and the regional plan, it sounds like the transportation chapter, both the goals and policies, which I think we included in your memo, but not necessarily um, put on the slides, are what you would want to be reviewing. You'd want to make sure that concerns about accessibility are adequately represented so that before staff even talks to you, we have some guiding principles on what accessibility needs are and how they need to be considered. Um, I know we have some associated with parking and we definitely talk about one of the challenges of the land use pattern that the plan promotes is it promotes things called activity centers, which activity centers are areas like the downtown being developed in certain parts of town. So it wouldn't be, you know, right now when we think about ADA parking, ADA parking is a site by site need. But when you create something that functions more like a commercial district, 
you have to have a different approach to providing parking accessibility. And so we've tried to create a guideline under the parking section. And let me see if that's that that you can see ADA parking is here, but we tried to create a guideline that says if you're working on parking at a district level like the downtown or like maybe a new district that might be created, that we're making sure that the ADA parking is really centrally located and provided in a way that is meaningful and not creating long distances for people to walk. But that might not be the, the right approach or the only guideline we need. So I think this section in particular on streetscapes and parking really needs the eyes of this commission so that we don't miss something that you feel would be obvious. And you've got to kind of think of it not as like a particular place, like an accessibility audit is a very site specific activity. But these are like the big guiding principles so that before we even have a place that has a sidewalk, we're really talking about what needs to be done and prepared for at that very early planning stage. So this is this is the area I think, given like what we've talked about, at least so far, I really like to hear back from you on. And I think, as I said earlier, and I'll just indicate it again, we're here early in the process. The 60 day review started on October 20th and it ends on December 19th. So you have time to form a subcommittee and review this and actually put in a formal letter. Um, I'll show you some other ways too that you can participate if you'd like to do so more individually than as a committee, but or as a commission um, and provide some information on that as well. But if we start having one of the other key things about parking to know is that um, the state legislature has started to take some actions and pass some laws that are limiting how much on-site parking we can ask for in certain scenarios. This is going to make our on-street parking really important. And Flagstaff is unusual um, in the world of winter parking ordinances because we require that nobody can park overnight for most of the year. Burlington, Vermont is the only other city in the U.S. with an ordinance that, that is that restrictive. Most other cities do odd-even and so I think one of the action items in the plan is that we need to go back and look at our winter parking ordinance because we are going to not be able to provide as much on-site parking as we have historically for new development. And that this is a high priority. This That's the kind of project too that, you know, it won't get done the second the plan gets adopted. It'll probably be the kind of thing that takes us three or four years to do, but it's really going to be important. It's a, It's not a status quo policy that we are going to be able to maintain for much longer, given that other things around us are changing. Russ, did you have your hand up? Oh, sorry. I did, but I put it down because you pretty much answered that. I was going to ask you about the new regulations from the state legislature, but. Right, we, we have been talking about that in this committee um, because we know that's going to change what we can be working on. Um, so we've tried to provide a plan that is heading in that direction, but maybe heading in a direction that tells us what do we need to do to be adapting to that as well. Thank you, so, sir. So yeah, this is, and maybe I've previewed this a little by the questions you've asked, um, but the high priority action items for transportation from this committee, from the committee that's worked with us is to evaluate alternative methods of snow removal so we can allow for year round on street parking and multimodal travel to complete a streets master plan for the city. And then also the one that really is county related is to establish a rural transit service for the region. So to move beyond just having van pools and paratransit in the region and having a more robust rural transit service. That really is not something the city is gonna engage on directly, but that's the big transportation goal from the regional plan for the county to work on. And this is the growth and land use chapter, which you think would just be about land use, actually does talk a lot about streetscapes. Um, at least it does show some aspirational goals. We really do want to see the opportunity of the master streets plan include a more diverse way of approaching street improvements. Um, and, you know, you said like some of these 
you know, if you look at any of these images and you think, boy, that has accessibility issues, I can have these images adjusted and changed. So this might be another area in the growth and land use chapter, which is chapter four, that you might want to put some attention to in providing comments is, do some of signs like this, like does having the parking on the outside of the bike lane create accessibility issues? You know, this this drawing, for instance, also has a parking area this way as well. But, you know, what do you need to see if buildings move closer to the street? If, you know, is getting to a transit stop where you have to cross things of issue? That's we'd love to hear feedback from you on these kinds of designs. This is kind of what you see in like, you know, what they call the NACTO guide that that's, we're providing some evidence. This is the direction we wanna be moving on major streets, um, especially in our urban areas. But if there's accessibility issues in here that we're overlooking, we would want your feedback. Um, there's some other things in other chapters. There's talk about how to support vehicle electrification and public access points to our parks and open space, as well as um, improving evacuation routes and the needs for secondary fire access in the rural areas of the county. Um, that's been an issue in several locations with the fires and flooding. Um, Flagstaff requires secondary access for new neighborhoods over certain sizes, like you have to have a second egress and ingress to the community, but Coconino County does not, and so they have more places where this is an issue and it's much harder issue to retrofit than it is to fix on the front end. So that could be something that's changing for the county in the future too as a result of working together on this. So there's a lot of ways as a commission you can participate. You can individually or as a board and commission um, review the plan and send in comments. Um, we're still gonna go next month to the Bikes and Pet Advisory Commission. So if you wanted to attend and talk with them as well and do some cross commission work, um, that's something you can do. Um, we have, I'll show you how the Conveya website. There's a place to review the document collaboratively if that's how you would like to do so. But you can also send me formal letters or informal emails providing comments. Um, in November, we are having workshops at four locations. I'll provide you some information on that. Um, and we also, if there's a group in town that you think needs to be involved and needs more information, we're happy to do one-on-one -on -one presentations. So this is the 60 day public review rough timeline. Um, we started the review on, on October 20th. Everything went online. On Monday, we did just a webinar that was about 45 minutes. It wasn't as specific as this one but it talked kind of the big issues that are coming up in the next 60 days. And that's on our YouTube page already. Yep. Okay. It's on the YouTube page for the city already. So you can go watch it and get the longer version of this presentation. Um, you can come to one of the community workshops. The transportation one is on November 13th. The one about parks, recreation, and open space and natural resources is on the 14th. Growth and land use is on the 16th and the Infrastructure, water, energy one is on the 18th. Um, Elsa is happy to arrange childcare at any of these meetings. We have a contract with Boys and Girls Club and we can have registered childcare providers. So if you need childcare to be able to attend these meetings, you need to let us know and we can make sure there's some assistance there. Um, we also have weekly office hours, except for the day after Thanksgiving, because we don't think anybody would come, um, from 11 to 2 p.m. at various locations. The one this week is going to be is being hosted at the Chamber of Commerce office on Route 66, um, and I think the next one is at the Murdoch Center the following week. But these are just drop-in times. I'm going to be sitting there with my laptop, and Elsa and Joe probably are too, and Melissa Shaw from the county. And if you have questions and you want to get into more details on anything in the plan, you can just come and ask us. You can have just flip through the document with us and tell us what you think. Um, and then much like today, we are working on over a dozen board and commission presentations. Um, we also staff is still working on the document, too. I said the document's not done. It's out for a draft review. We're actually creating case studies and testing how would this plan be different than what we do currently? Is the language clear? Could somebody try and like, I, I said this when we were doing the Plaza Vieja plan, I've used it ever since, is you wanna make sure you write things 
in a way that someone couldn't turn against their purpose. Um, and that's an important thing. We're kind of playing devil's advocate internally and trying to make sure we have really created a plan that is functional and works for the community on day one. So I want to talk a little about Conveo, if you have a chance to review this area of the, the this is how it looks currently for Dony Park, Timberline Fernwood when they were doing their draft plan. But it's basically a format where you can click on a comment button and drop a comment anywhere in the document. It actually, for this document, has a pull down menu so you can navigate between chapters. Um, you can kind of put it on a map or put it on a part of the document. You can ask a question. Um, and then we basically get a spreadsheet of all of this. You can also vote each other's comments up and down and reply to each other's comments. So if you'd like something that's um, interactive and online, this would give you an opportunity to participate that way. Um, what's going to happen after the 60 day review is I'm hoping I'm going to have a lot of comments um, and that I'm going, my staff and I are going to spend some time analyzing them and figuring out how to incorporate them. If there are any complex or controversial issues, we may reignite the regional plan committee in January or February and ask them to look at a particular topic. We, whenever we adopt a big document like that, we have to send it to legal review and when asking legal to review 200 pages for any possible legal comment, <laughs> it takes a while. It's people that wonder what we're doing. So I always put it on the timeline so people know if you're not hearing from us, I'm probably doing the legal review with the, with our attorneys. Um, <clears throat> then um, Stacy and I get to do another fun project together, which is we're going to have a planning retreat for the city council, the board of supervisors, and both the planning and zoning commission for the city and the county so that they can go through the document cover to cover and ask all of their questions before the public hearings start. Um, the city is planning to conduct our public hearings first in like April, May, and June of next year because we need to be through with that process by June if we want it on a November 2025 ballot. That all assumes everything stays on track and there's no delays or issues that really make us go back to the drawing board. But we, if there are, we will adapt and move to another another timeline if needed, because it's more important to get the content right than it is to stay on this timeline. But this is our initial guess at the timeline. Um, the county has actually chosen that they're going to adopt their updated comprehensive plan and then come back and adopt this plan as an amendment to it. That comprehensive plan is being reviewed right now by the county staff and a committee that they're working with. And um, we are involved in that too. So city staff is reviewing it and asking questions and making sure they have correct data and just like the county staff has done on this document. So um, I think that we are making sure that when that happens, since this is how the county's approaches to do their comp plan first, that those two documents work together right away. So that's everything I have. It's a pretty long presentation, but I know that like we've not visited with you in a while and this is a lot of information to take in. But you're kind of doing your homework for next year's ballot, even after you spent, you know, an hour plus trying to fill out your ballot this year. <laughs> Sarah, would you mind giving us again the website where we can look at all of that? Sure, I'll put it in the chat for you all. Thank you. Uh, and then just to the commissioners, I would like to say if anybody's interested in creating an informal group about this, um, would you inbox Stacy and I so that we can make that happen? And Russ, I see your hand up again. Yeah, I was just going to say I would like to see the commission um, take some type of action on this, even if it is an informal group. Um, so and then I do have some questions for Sarah as well. Um, I assume that when we look at uh, potential city growth, um, we understand and recognize that the university tells us that they are uh, looking at potential growth themselves. And uh, and hence, can we assume that there'll be a lot of the high density housing that would be planned for close to the university? Let me go pull back up a map to answer that question. OK, did let me put it on. Let me let me throw my slide back up. So we we did talk about that. I mean, 
I think you have to look at um, NAU's growth projections with a grain of salt. Um, the population that NAU would like to zoom in a little bit. The population that NAU typically recruits for students is a shrinking population cohort, essentially. Um, so every university in the country is says they're going to grow and they are all competing for a smaller and smaller of pool of what is traditionally college age people and increasing college costs. So um, that is another part of why the community's population projections and are very unclear in the future. The areas on this future growth illustration that would support large multifamily development and mixed use development are these darker brown areas, which are suburban centers. Yes. The dark purple areas that are um, urban centers. So you see a few of those, not all near campus. But yes, the areas in Woodlands Village and Milton Road Corridor could continue to see and support the kind of development that the Hub and the Standard and the Uncommon, which I think is Ugo now, they all change their names after they get built. So planners always know what's like in the file. Um, those are all the kinds of developments we could see in those areas. All of those areas are zoned to allow that kind of development today. And because of the way the Private Property Rights Protection Act was written that passed in 2006, we are very unlikely to be able to downzone them in any way. We did really look at that underlying zoning um, and try and be realistic about what could or could not be accomplished. But lowering building heights or lowering densities in those locations is very, very difficult. Um, and property owners have a way to opt out, essentially. And, and Sarah, thank you for that. And that was really kind of my next question, which you kind of answered already, but I know the city does what it can in the planning so as to displace as few people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Displacement of people is kind of a major concern for me. I was involved um, with the folks who were trying to stop the Arrowhead trailer park from being um, completely taken away. And of course, that, that private property owner did what he wanted to do. And now, of course, we see it sitting empty just kind of a ragged zone for the last five years. So um, displacement, uh, I'm glad to see displacement of current uh, people is kind of a high concern with regards to this plan. Thanks, yeah, that, and it is, it's a challenging one. It's, you know, I, I've i heard it from both sides, the people like we really have to include it in the plan, but then I think also people who are on the side of, who understand how the rules are currently written know that it's not going to be an easy promise to fulfill. It'll take a lot of work and it won't be able to be as easy to do as saying, well, we don't want displacement. Um, but we did look really carefully at like where we were drawing those dark purple and those dark brown colors and thinking about, are we doing this in a way that increases displacement risk? Or are we doing it in a way that supports maintaining affordable housing units and, and increasing the supply, which is a key part of reaching our housing affordability goals, and it's not the only part. All right, do we have commissioners with other questions? Sarah, your hand is up, but did you address what you needed to? Or maybe it was while you were trying to get connected. I think it was while I was trying to get connected i okay. was like what i th actually think raising my hand turned my chat on somehow <laughs> weird outlook things were happening okay just wanted to make sure yeah well so i hope thank you so much for so much of your commission time today um yeah i would love to have your input and more and if you form a subcommittee and you'd like us to meet with you and answer more questions i'm very happy to do so me or elsa can show up and help navigate if that's what you would like Sarah, I think that I will reach out to you within this next week. I know that we're going to have probably three or four commission. Well, it can only be three commissioners that are going to be uh, interested in doing a subcommittee or an informal working group. So I will reach out to you. Um, I've got your email. I've got your phone number. I'll reach out to you and maybe we can set something up for you to come and talk to the informal working group if that's all right. That would be excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any other commissioners with questions for Sarah? 
All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to everybody who came for this. I believe this is like one of the biggest things for our commission besides therapeutic recreation. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Moving on to accessibility audits. And I know that Russ and Keith were part of the October 5th um, accessibility audit down, not downtown, south side of the tracks. And so I will let both of them uh, talk about that audit. Russ, go ahead. Okay, so um, in the past, and, and I'm talking probably seven or eight years ago, but, but for a number of years, this commission uh, conducted accessibility audits on a regular basis. It was kind of like an ongoing thing that this commission did. And then I think that stopped probably um, maybe before the pandemic, but definitely during the pandemic. So um, basically, I would like to see us uh, do accessibility audits, probably starting with public buildings, city build, probably starting with city buildings, and then moving on to other public buildings, um, and then moving on to private buildings as well. Um, I know, Stacy. I think you were going to check with a uh, city attorney if we could actually engage in that. Yes, so um, generally speaking, the public buildings are absolutely um, open for that type of, of audit. Um, where it gets really sticky is when we start to talk about private um, buildings where he felt that there was um, some ability and, and some perhaps partnership as if they were to um, invite us directly, that they were um, seeking to have those types of audits done um, on their own accord. We would not have any sort of um, authority, if you will, to um, require us to provide some sort of, of audit um, for that particular business. It really needed to be um, initiated by them. Of course, we could provide information, let them know that this service is available, um, but we couldn't impose any sort of requirement for them to participate, if that helps. And Russ, the private the private um, businesses, that may be something that we can work with Susan and welcomed here in doing. If we would, like, like Stacy said, we wouldn't be doing it as a commission but we would just be doing it as citizens. And that's kind of, I think, the goal of Welcomed Here. And so Susan may be a better one to talk to about that. Yeah, I was actually, yeah, I was actually going to raise my hand and, and that any anyone, public part of the commission, more than welcome to become a volunteer for Welcomed Here and do um, audits for organizations. Um, I'm an I'm an N of one <laughs> for the organization right now, and so if we start telling uh, local businesses that um, I can provide that uh, service for them without having additional people on board for um, supporting that service, I'm I'm just concerned about letting people down uh, right away. Um, so um, I think it would be better for us to just as a commission focus on our public spaces already and um, come up with, I can continue to come up with a plan uh, with Welcomed Here to recruit volunteers to be able to do the, the private uh, business audits um, that people may request. I think that sounds super. Um, so, and Susan, I appreciate that. I think you have some um, expertise in this area that I do not. Um, but I, I would very much like to be involved in that that process. Um, and, and Rachel, I'll tell you, you know, when Keith and I were on that accessibility walk downtown, oh my gosh, <laughs> there is a lot of lack of accessibility on, just on our sidewalks. Yeah, um, It's just kind of amazing to me. And um, I also think, Rachel, sometimes for, for somebody like myself, I don't have a, a, a mobility issue, so I don't always notice when there's a lack of accessibility, whereas um, other folks might notice that. So um, it's a big concern, something I think this commission should address. And and starting with public buildings is fabulous. Um, when we talk public buildings, we're talking city buildings. Are we also talking county buildings? Are we also talking public school buildings? 
It would just be city buildings, at least from from the perspective of this commission. You got to remember that this commission is really solely a city commission. Um, so I think that in looking at things like school districts um, in the county, we would likely need to treat them very similarly um, to what we would as a private business, if you will. Uh, we can let them know that it's available, uh, but it would be up to them to take advantage of that. And Russ, I've reached out to Geronimo Vasquez, who is the, I don't know what his official name is, but he's kind of the head of the county supervisor, um, the superintendents. And he is really open to some audits, but um, I think that we need to have some more one-on-ones if that's what we want to do. And Susan, I don't know if you want to reach out that far, but if you can get enough auditors, I don't know if Welcomed Here is willing to help with county as well. Yeah. County as well. Yes, um, we worked with Yavapai down there. So um, it's just, a, again, a matter of having enough volunteers. And, and Susan, Geronimo, I have to... Go ahead, Russ. Geronimo is a county supervisor. Um, he's actually one of my former students as well. But um, Geronimo would be very open to it. Geronimo is a true advocate and an ally of the disability community. He absolutely is. Um, and as a supervisor, he can kind of make some things happen for, for, for county buildings, I think. You know, um, I did a, a kind of an informal accessibility audit of the, Pine, uh, the Pepsi Amphitheater and extremely disappointed in things that I've seen, extremely. Uh, and so I wanted to talk to Susan, um, not outside of this commission, to find out the best way forward. Because as a commission, there's not a lot that we can do with that, with but as a citizen and perhaps working with Welcomed Here, it would be something that we could work with her. So I look forward to kind of working with Susan outside of the commission and doing some of this. And Russ, it sounds like you and Keith also would be extremely interested in that. Um, Sarah, I don't know how interested you are, but you know, it starts with us. And we know people that are disabled and we need to reach out to them. You know, Joseph Spence, you would be great on some of these accessibility audits. And so I think as a commission, maybe reaching out to people that we know, Russ, you've got a vast array of people, you know, and, well, and just and, asking them. And, and Rachel, and you know this, I mean, kind of the special um, concern I have is with the public schools, um, Flagstaff right. Unified School District, where yeah. I worked for 41 years, you know, and and I absolutely know there are a lot of inaccessible spaces that are that are being used. And that's just kind of a special situation for me. Um, I also know that um, our Flagstaff Unified School District is going to have three new governing board members um, starting in January. Mm -hmm. And I know at least two of those are very interested in making sure that their buildings are accessible. Yeah. So I can be definitely part of that process. Okay. So let's get together with Susan outside of that and let's see where we can get started. Uh, Welcomed here, I think, would be a great resource, like a perfect resource for us to get this going, but we need the people. So, um, Ada, I do see your hand up as well. All right. So I would also be interested in working on this. And in terms of finding more people with disabilities to help with these audits, I'd like to suggest contacting provider agencies in town. Um, from my previous career, I worked with a provider that has a DTA or daytime activity group. And reaching out to those providers like Quality Connections, Lucor, Hajoni, Strides to Thrive, they care for a lot of adults in the daytime running activities to provide a meaningful day and offering the opportunity for those people to go out into the community and complete these audits and voice their concerns and their needs about accessibility um, could open up a really good pool of people to help with this. Perfect. Thank you, Ada. I really do appreciate that. Um, Joseph, I see your hand is up as well. Yes, uh, Mr. Randall, if you remember, Mr. Randall, we actually we actually went outside at uh, at Coconino actually to see the woods area and that was not that was not wheelchair friendly, if you remember what we did that day. I do. We did that in our summer program with with Kevin. Yes, we. And I, yes, and, we did. And I remember you also went around the building, but um, at Coconut High School, where I worked all those years, we found a lot yes, of inaccessible did. spaces. We did. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Susan, I see your hand up.
Yes, so I, I find out the rules <laughs> on things. So um, if we were to do a commission-led um, audit of the city facilities, um, are we violating any commission um, rules for being gathered together more than three in a space at the same time? <laughs> there can only be three of us. If there is four, you need to give Stacy a week's notice so that she can post it. Um, I don't know what that's called, Stacy. you can speak to that. Yeah, we just would need to do a, a notice of quorum. Um, the, the in, I think we can structure this in a way that um, would allow more than three to go and participate in conducting an audit. Um, there would be a lot of collaboration with, um, you know, different people within the different facilities. And as long as that action is focused solely on just the audit, we're not necessarily talking about commission business. Those are things that could occur. Um, I think if we put just enough planning in it, we'll, we'll make sure that it can happen because ultimately your findings will come back mm -hmm. to the commission as a whole mm -hmm. in a public meeting to discuss and then formulate, you know, a formal uh, written recommendation that goes not only to the city council, but, um, you know, to leadership within the, the the city. So I hope that that helps. I think there's ways to accomplish it with more than three, um, but we we need to have some discussions about kind of parameters and rules about what could be um, discussed during that time, if you will. Okay, so, so then the other piece would be, um, there would need to be an opportunity for training on an accessibility audit, uh, an actual form to use uh, to document everything um, so that there's consistency in what is being reviewed. Um, and I am more than happy to do that type of a training. Um, and then what would be the time frame that we would want to start something like this to be able to provide um, you know, adequate recommendations in a timely manner <laughs> um, to the city. Um, if that's a question, I think that's a question for me. Um, I think the timeline is really um, up to you guys to determine. Um, I can share that, you know, the recommendations that come in terms of the results of these audits would be shared with our leadership, would be shared with our council, and would, um, you know, the the recommendation of the, the commission would be to incorporate these, you know, um, these things and, and perhaps the necessary improvements in future and ongoing budget um, requests. We've talked about it a lot. You all know the constraints that the city is within financially, but the first step is really identifying what needs to change, um, what needs to be addressed, and then how do we work that potentially into our plans from a budgeting perspective to address those. Okay, thank you. Ada, I see your hand up. Yeah, so I believe this is a question for Stacy, and I'm curious about what information the city could provide to help prioritize or organize what buildings are audited first. Like for example, if there's a new building being planned, if there could be an audit of the plans for accessibility that the commission has involvement in, or if there are any buildings where there are projects coming up for renovations or you know if if we yeah you know, what kind of information could help prioritize the schedule it's an excellent question and a great suggestion we do have a facility advisory committee um, that meets pretty frequently to identify um, the the things that are needed throughout the city we've had a lot of deferred maintenance so they've been going through a process of identifying what needs to be um, upgraded, creating a timeline for that. So I could approach that committee. I could approach our public works division who oversees our facilities section um, to see if they could provide uh, that kind of information in terms of planning. I really like your idea of, you know, what's scheduled to be perhaps um, upgraded. Um, you know, I know we've got probably some stuff happening at City Hall in the next couple of years. Um, and so maybe that rises to a, a larger priority um, and in, in asking us to come and look at that. So I'm happy to, I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow. So I will add this to my list and see if they can provide some, some information and context to that request. Thank you, Thank Aiden. You. Uh, Russ, I see your hand up. And, and I was going to ask the same question as Elida did, um, but 
The other point, I think, is from my perspective, the more the public needs access and has access to that uh, city facility, the more important um, accessibility is. So to me, it seems like it, it would be a more a higher priority that like the library, and we know that the East Flag Public Library has a problem with access in the children's bathroom. We know that, but the more the public is accessing the building, to me, the higher the priority it becomes that that building is accessible. So I, I don't know, I kind of feel like this may be something that um, Susan can help us work on and then bring it back to the commission um, before we decide to do the audit. Maybe work with Susan and whoever else to figure out the priority for what to get done. But I think first and foremost, Susan needs to do, and, and I was part of what she was training with Yavapai and other people, but um, the training that she does is is just spectacular. And I would suggest that any commissioner, and Sarah, I see that you put in, even this would all fall in alignment with the therapeutic recreation portion of our commission. But I think that all of us should take Susan's training before we take the step of starting the audits. So, um, line. So, for <laughs> um, putting some of these things together, um, I I would recommend that we have at least an informal working group. Um, to do that initial identification of which facilities are going to be the um, priority list. And then from there, um, as an informal group, outline a, a timeline that would make sense for the, the uh, group to start gathering that data um, so that I can put together a relevant training specifically for um, the commission. And Rest then move from there. <laughs> Russ, would you be willing to start an informal working group? Well, I was I was going to be willing to join Susan's informal working group. <laughs> Susan is already doing therapeutic recreation. And I think, I, I don't know, Susan, are you ready to take on another one? Ready to take on another one? The informal working group would be beginning uh, in November. I would be more uh, available. <laughs> Let's put it that way uh, to assist. Um, so, Susan, I'm going to I'll send you an email saying that I'm interested in being on the informal working group. It sounds like so is Joseph. I know so is Keith. I think maybe Elida and Rachel. I think probably you, quite honestly. Um, yeah. Whatever you guys want it, me to do, I'll do. Whatever you guys want me to do, I'll so do. So I'll send I'll send Susan an email. I'll put all the rest of you guys on it and we'll see how it goes from there. OK. And then we're going to need to move on from this. But Keith, I know that you wanted to say something about the audit. Oh, well, there's not a whole lot I can say that was good about that audit. There was, <laughs> there was, there was a whole lot of uh, issues um, that I saw and discovered on that. And uh, I, I, I could probably go on for an hour or so on all of that. And I, I won't do that now, but there was a whole lot of things that were very inaccessible uh, to people with uh, visuals, uh, um, uh, struggles, and people that are differently abled as far as using uh, devices to get around. So um, there's not a whole lot that I really want to say right, right at this moment. <laughs> Keith, would you mind putting all of your concerns in an email and sending it to me? And then um, I am talking to Mandia and Kim still at Metroplan um, concerning this and other things, but uh, I know that they would be absolutely interested because you did participate. They would be, I am interested in what you have to say. Um, and so we're going to be doing other accessibility walk audits with them. So if you can get an email to me, I would certainly get that into the next meeting that I have with them. Yeah, I put a bunch of scribbles on the paper they gave us to uh, fill out uh, throughout the walk. And um, I'm more than happy to let them give you that uh, paper that okay. I that I wrote because I wrote down a whole lot of uh, things that I saw along the way um, that were uh, obstacles and uh, things that could use improvement. Some things, you know, you can't really change. 
um, but maybe uh, getting with the property owners to and maybe working with them as far as costs on changing some of the items like uh, you know the sidewalk went across uh, a driveway that was uh, very ramped and that would be terrible for somebody in a wheelchair to try to cross that thing um, and it wasn't real good um, unfortunately uh, the lady that was helping us in the walk was helping my wife and I wish she didn't um, because I, I would have been behind my wife to assist my wife before she crashed into something. But, um, you know, it also kept my wife from, I mean, on that slant, my wife would have been walking towards the street. Yeah. Okay. Just because of the slant, you know, and uh, she's not in a wheelchair, she's walking, but it just, it's because she is elderly, uh, gravity takes hold. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I will um, talk to Kim and yeah, Mendia and about that. I'll have you write down what I can remember. Okay. And then um, I will come back next month um, and let the commission know what Kim and Mendia are working on. I think that that this will also tie into the strategic 2045 plan. And so I'm kind of really excited to do more of the audit walks and stay in touch with Metro Plan. Um, so let's let's keep that momentum going. Uh, are there any other questions or concerns about this particular item? All right, then we're going to move on to our spring recognition event. Uh, this was talked about in our summer planning meeting that we would like to have. Uh, we don't do banquets anymore, thank God, but we would like to do some sort of spring recognition event. And I would love to hear from our commissioners about when, what, exactly what all of you think that's going to look like. I know that in the past, um, the commission has done something at this foyer in City Hall. Uh, Russ, you can speak to that, and I see your hand is up. Yeah, and actually, I think we found that to be rather easy to do. I think we did it twice, um, and I wish Jamie's not here. Is he? Is Jamie here no. today? Jamie no. is not. He's teaching. I think we did it twice, and I know Jamie and I were involved with the planning of that. Um, I remember one time was when um, actually uh, Mayor Evans was the mayor, and she kind of did the actual presentations of the awards, but it, it was really not that difficult to do, um, and we did not spend very much money. I think we um, probably had probably seven or eight people who actually were recognized, um, mostly young people, honestly. Um, the commission was more comfortable granting awards um, to young people, perhaps uh, uh, more so than to the adults. Um, but in, it was as simple as putting together a um, kind of an award paper and then putting it under glass in a frame and inviting people to it. And I think we, we chipped in and brought, um, you know, food, um, a cake, and um, and some drinks, and we did it. It was kind of easy. Um, so I would love to see us do it again sometime in the spring. Well, and I know that the mayor said that she could do a small budget for us, and so that's kind of I think where I would like to lead. When do we want to do this so that we can get Sean, Stacy, and the mayor? ready for all of that. So when do we want to do it? Number one. Uh, Susan, go ahead. I am vaguely recalling class as um, planners for something like this. Um, so in the spring, I have up to 30 students in a special event planning course that partner with community organizations to plan and implement um, an event. And the, those events uh, occur in April. And so um, we could potentially use uh, this commission as one of the uh, agencies for the students to do the planning and um, target kind of a, a mid to late April um, because of the weather uh, event that could be nice both indoor or outdoor if we need to say use the <clears throat> the landing at the city hall um, 
you know, the front as part of it or um, finding a, another um, space that that may be an indoor outdoor accessible uh, location. So um, how does everybody feel? How do the commissioners feel about that? I think that's a perfect idea. I think that's a perfect idea. Actually, I agree on that. Russ, Russ has his thumb up. What do, what do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I think that would be great. And Keith puts in the chat that he agrees. So Susan, that's all so, on you, my friend. It is not all on me. So <laughs> let me just um, say I'm their I'm their academic um, you know person. So I cannot be their agency supervisor. Um, okay. So they would need to work. Uh, most likely with Rachel, unless someone else wants to take the lead on this uh, event, um, but they would work specifically with someone else. And then I would be able to um, work with both uh, parties on, uh, separately. So can you uh, get in touch with them? Yep. Okay. We, we can discuss the, the parameters and the details um, more in November. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> and, and, I'll just quickly say this applies to any um, city or community organization. So if there's anyone else that is uh, present today who's interested in this kind of experience for students to plan something for them, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Susan, can we um, can we put this on the agenda for November and then have somebody from that organization here? Um, it would be me because um, the students aren't uh, together yet until spring. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you let you let me know when we're ready to move forward with this. It doesn't sound like it's going to take a whole lot. No. Um, so just let me know. Uh, Russ, your hand is up. And I was just going to ask, should this be an action item um, to vote on at November meeting? That we would actually vote on ha holding um, a recognition event in April? I think we could I think we could have a some kind of codification of of this direction. I mean, we've got we've got commission uh, agreement to to start this process, but I think it would be good to formalize that. I can add it. Awesome. All right, moving on. Uh, let's see the next uh, action item that we have is the consideration and possible action to change our December 25th meeting. Um, and so we're either going to need to cancel it or reschedule it. What does everybody think? Oh, that's on Christmas Day, correct? That is Christmas Day. So I, I, think, that we could, I think that we could either move that to the 18th or even as possible early as the 11th. What does everybody think? Me personally, I would say the 18th, but it's up to you guys. I I do not care. I I really do not care. So. Susan says the 18th in the chat. I'm okay with the 18th. Sarah, Keith, Keith says the 18th. Russ says the 18th. Sarah? 18th works for me. So let's change. Let's um, um, do. Do we need to vote on this, Stacy? Yes. OK, can we do that now? It's an action item. Yep. OK, all in favor. Oh, can I have a motion to change the meeting from the 25th of December to the 18th of December? This is Russ. I so move. Thank you, Russ. Do I hear a second? I'll second. I'll do a second motion on. Wait, I'll do a third so motion on that one. Joseph, only commissioners can vote on this, Sonny. Sorry, Rachel. That's all right. You're fine. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimously passed. We will change that meeting date to the 18th. All right, moving on. Let's talk about, oops, sorry. Update from Council Liaison Mayor Daggett. I don't believe she's here. Is she, Stacey? Uh, she is not. She sends her apologies. She had a last meeting, minute meeting with Senator Kelly that came up this morning. So she hopes to attend next month. That is definitely an important thing. All right. And my fabulous friend next is Lorena Reyes from Mountain Line. Um, actually, Rachel, I'm sorry. I just saw Russ's hand pop up. Oh, I'm sorry. 
That's okay. I'm sorry. I had a quick question, Stacy. Um, I know when Rachel and I met with the mayor, uh, we had talked about the mayor putting together a uh, meeting with the city manager's office and then some of the department heads along with some of the commissioners and her. Um, and I think Sean Johnson was going to work on setting up that meeting. And I was just checking if you know of any progress has been made on that. Um, I don't. I know that there was a request to the city manager to see, uh, you know, who would may be involved. But I'll, I will check on the status. Um, I'm not sure. Thank you, Stacey. I appreciate that. All right, moving on. Lorena, you have the floor. Hi, thank you, Chair Simaconda. Um, just wanted to provide an update to the group. I'm very proud to say that our WAVE um, subcommittee um, presented our WAVE need to City Council um, earlier this month. Big thanks to Rachel and Jamie. Um, it was really well done, um, heartfelt, factual, um, and I think that council really listened. And so I think, um, you know, we're checking off our to-do lists. Next on the list is to set up um, some mini interviews with KNAU as well as possibly the Daily Sun. So more word on that. We do have an upcoming WAVE subcommittee meeting here in November. Um, the date soon to be announced. Um, just waiting for a few more people to answer the meeting poll times. Um, wanted to put on everyone's radar that we do have a coordinated mobility council meeting as well in November. So if you want any more information on that, you can contact me directly um, as well as visit um, our Mountain Lane website. And I can put my um, contact information in the chat here shortly. Um, and then just a little bit on travel. I did attend the Arizona um, Rail Transportation Summit um, and got to be in person um, with the mobility managers who um, assess and help our subrecipients receive 5310 funding. Um, and so um, that was a good experience. And um, if you have any questions on that, um, also you feel free to contact me directly. That's all I have. Again, big shout out to Rachel and Jamie. Thanks, Lorena. All right, next we are going to hear from our friend Joseph Spence. Rachel, I just want to say you're doing a good job with all this. Thank you. With all this, um, uh, Ms. Randall, I hate, I, I don't mind asking this. Do you, have, do you have any notes for me? Because I don't have my notes. Does anybody have any notes for me? I don't have any notes. I can help you out, Joseph. I can report that at yesterday's community practice transition team meeting, a lot of file was formally um chosen as our second youth liaison to this commission oh, yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, I would like to welcome elida to our commission meetings as our as our second youth liaison um and then elida do you have anything to add with regards to what happened at yesterday's meeting as an update it's you and thank you so yesterday we had a presentation from belinda escalante and she works with DES, and she talked to us about pre-employment um, pre transition services that are available through DES. And this is absolutely something to spread the word about. Um, these are services that are available to any youth age 14 to 22 participating in an educational program, which does have a broad array of definitions, can even include homeschooled students. Um, Pre-ETH is what we call it for short, and it includes five service items. So they help with job exploration, work readiness, post-secondary education and training counseling, work-based learning, and self-advocacy skills. There are some requirements on receiving the service. Um, for example, they cannot receive the service if they're also in a transition to work program unless there's a gap in the curriculum. Um, it is provided through vocational rehabilitation, but generally schools help with coordinating this. And sorry, it could get too lengthy here. So um, Belinda Escalante is really happy to be contacted by anyone who's interested in this service. And she works to coordinate with people around difficulties in the service. Like, for example, if the service is only provided outside of school time hours, um, 
And I'll try to drop, DES has a web page on this that has more information and some of the relevant forms. So I'll drop that in the chat in a moment. And then another takeaway from yesterday's meeting, um, tomorrow, so I'm referencing an email here, um, the Arizona Department of Health Services Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs Program is um, hosting an event and it's a focus group for families of children and or young adults up to age 26 in Flagstaff to discuss and share input on how they can improve their work. It'll be tomorrow, so kind of short notice today, from 12.30 to 2.30 at the East Flagstaff Community Library. So a couple things to spread the word about there. Awesome. Elida and Joseph, Elida, welcome to the team. And uh, do either one of you have anything else? I think we're all good, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Moving on. Pardon? Uh, I was just saying thank you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Welcome to the team, Elida. Uh, the next thank is you. our update from Jamie, our sidewalk liaison. Um, he is not here, but I will speak um, about what's going on. Uh, we had a meeting with Reggie and his team, and Reggie will be here next month. Is that right, Stacy? Correct. I have confirmed and that. Then, Reggie has requested that he be kind of the first to be able to speak um, simply because his team goes out in the afternoon and he wants to be able to make sure that his team is here to give us the attention that we need. Um, so they will be here next month. They will be talking about some of the issues that we've been talking about um, in the informal working group from going back quite a ways. Um, he will be speaking to some of that. So that's what's going on with sidewalk liaison next month. Also with parking liaison, um, uh, Chief Conley, our new police chief will be here and he will be talking a lot about a committee that he is making um, and the different things that are going on. Um, so I think that that's everything from both Jamie and I. Uh, any questions for any of our liaisons? All right, moving right along. Information to and from Inclusion and Adaptive Living Commission members or staff liaison. Uh, I would like to say one thing, and that is, um, Susan, we will put it in the next um, agenda, but uh, Susan will be making her decision or has made her decision about being vice, um, vice chairperson. So um, Susan, do you wanna speak to that or do you wanna wait till next month? Um, I would vice chair. Um, I just wasn't sure what we were going to do about the voting for all of that. So that could be next month. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and Elida has put the link to the DES webpage regarding um, pre ETS. If anyone is interested in that, uh, Keith, I do see your hand up. Uh, yes. Um, I'm, I've got a question. Um, I noticed a big problem uh, at Coconino High School on the corner of Isabel and Felice, and uh, they desperately need some kind of traffic control there. So um, I don't know who to contact on that. Do any of the commission members or Stacy, can you give me a clue on who to contact about that? Because my wife tried to cross the street there during uh, just before school started. Uh, she has a white cane. She almost got hit by a car. Nobody, she couldn't, she didn't even know when to cross the street. And um, she almost got hit by a car trying to cross the street. And I saw a student almost get hit by a car trying to cross the street. So um, if you guys can help me with that, that would be great. Martin, um, is that something that you can speak to? Did you guys could, yeah, I, I think, I think you, could, you could probably be the intro. I can, uh, Keith, I can give you a, a contact, an, e an email to send that information to. Yeah, send that to Stacy and have her forward that to me. Okay, will do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Martin. I also have a little bit maybe for uh, the next uh, meeting or the meeting after that um, about snow plowing. Um, the, the current snow plowing is, is, is not working, I don't think. So I'd like to get a discussion going. Um, I know somebody who uh, 
was on dialysis that had an issue with getting out from a side street onto a primary street, couldn't do it. And um, I ended up uh, taking this person uh, several times. Um, but that that is that, that's a danger. The way they they currently plow streets for for people with that need to get the dialysis and and other things like that. So it it does cause a uh, a, a problem to uh, people that are differently able than just general public. Um, again, I, I would also like to maybe discuss because we're coming to snow season, so more snow issues like sidewalk 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 snow enforcement and business plowing enforcement. Um, so we can have those discussions about uh, snow coming up. And I'd like to try to get that on the agenda if we could. I see a couple of hands up and Keith, before I move on to them, I just want to let you know that code compliance doesn't necessarily do enforcement. They do compliance. So I think next month when Reggie comes, that's a good um, thing to ask him. But uh, Stacy, is it possible to get, uh, is it Sam Beckett? In yeah, so I, first meeting. Um, I made a note to reach out to Sam and to Scott. I wanted to let this group know that they are um, planning on presenting to the council on their snow readiness program on. Sorry, we just scheduled this. Bear with me. Maybe it's in December. It's, in their working calendar. it's on the city's working calendar, and I apologize. It's it's coming up very soon. Um, so that that would be something that I oh here it is November twelfth. Um, I will reach out to them to see if they can come to a commission meeting. I would recommend December. Our November agenda has gotten quite large. Um, yes. So it'll give them time to prepare. But also, if you can, if you're able to watch that meeting, that city council meeting, that may also help you formulate, you know, questions or or things that you want to present to them. OK, Russ, I see your hand up. Thank you, Rachel. And um, based upon what I just heard from you, I'm kind of excited to, to, to know that code compliance and Flagstaff PD will be represented at our next meeting um, because I think Perhaps there's some coordination that we would like to see occur between those two entities that perhaps doesn't occur right now, based upon what I heard from um, police civilian aid Becker when I contacted Flagstaff PD. Um, also, with regards to an update for me, I attended a, I was at the Disability Resource Fair where I met with um, Jason Sneed for quite a while, and then I also met with Jason after the fair. Uh, Jason is the legal counsel for the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. And um, again, one of the reasons why I'm glad to hear that the police chief has come to talk to us, because I have learned that research shows that people with disabilities are more likely to have an encounter with police and fire than those who are non-disabled. Um, police with disabilities have a high, higher cumulative possibility of arrest than the non-disabled population. People with disabilities have higher rates of conviction and longer sentences than the non-disabled, and people with disabilities are more likely to be physically injured when being arrested than the non-disabled. So um, I'm, I'm excited to, to hear that the police chief is actually coming to meet with us. Um, that discussion with Jason led me to a discussion with another attorney down in the Phoenix area um, <laughs> who specializes in ADA accommodations. And specifically, I talked to him about ADA Title II ADA Title II basically concerns itself with um, public entities and their requirements with regards to accessibility. And I learned that any public entity with 50 or more employees must by law have a designated ADA coordinator. So I think that's a discussion for us to have at future meetings about how uh, Flagstaff as a city um, public entity um, fulfills that legal obligation, I guess. So. Russ, would you like to see that maybe on January's meeting? I think so, yes, please. And then who would we invite? Um, with regards to the ADA compliance issue, Stacey, I, you can help me out with that. Yep, um, so I will, I've actually got that on our pending list. Um, we've talked about that a couple of times. Um, so HR and our legal team. Yes, that sounds so good, thank can you. We put, can we put that on January's meeting possibly? 
Yeah, that gives us sometimes uh, we've have a new HR director and so trying to get her up to speed before I drop a bunch of these things. So that gives us time. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate you mentioning that because that is definitely something that I want to stay focused on. Uh, Martin, I see you've had your hand up for a really long time, so take it away, my friend. Uh, actually, Chair, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Sarah since she's a member of the uh, commission and, and I'm just a hanger on. I'll go after her. Sarah put in the chat. Sarah, do you want to talk about what you put in the chat? No, nope, that's all I really wanted to share was okay. that um, just to support High Country Adaptive Sports and, and their programming for locals um, and just to spread the word. And uh, Sarah says that is a hiking group and they're meeting mm -hmm. three. I'm assuming those are Saturdays uh, in November. And so reach out to either High Country or Sarah. Is it OK if, if people reach out to you for questions? Yeah, I'll send the flyer on to Stacy for distribution as well. OK, thanks, Sarah. All right, Martin, go ahead. Um, my, thank you. Chair, mine is a little bit related. Um, uh, this Friday, two days from now, a group called the Network for Arizona Trails is putting on a, an event called the Summit for Arizona Trails. And I dropped the uh, link to the event in the chat. Uh, it's noteworthy for two reasons. Um, one, there are a couple of uh, groups that provide uh, adaptive uh, experiences uh, will be at the summit. Uh, one is a group called Luke 5 Adventures. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of that particular group. They are uh, kind of nationwide, but they're looking to open a chapter in Flagstaff in the in the coming months. In fact, if you look at their website, they have uh, there's like a tab for Flagstaff, but if you click it, there's actually no information. So that feels like it's a work in progress. Uh, the second group is uh, High Country Adaptive Sports, and Truman will be there, and I believe he is bringing some adaptive uh, mountain bikes. Um, to the event. And that, that's really the second notable thing um, about it is that they're at the beginning of the summit, there's going to be uh, a demonstration of adaptive sports equipment. Um, I'm guessing by those by those two groups. Um, it it feels it feels to me like this is um this is kind of a beginning um, that these groups are represented at the summit for trails. Um, it feels like something that can be expanded in the future um, as well. So I'll, I'll kind of keep my eyes on that. Um, I think other people in the in this group are kind of tied into those um, agencies as well. Um, I, I and just if you allow me just to rant for a moment, Madam Chair, <laughs> uh, about trails. I think when a lot of times it feels like when we build accessible trails, they they meet the definition of. ADA per the federal government, they end up being something that looks like a, a sidewalk that goes for maybe a quarter of a mile. Yeah. And if you're lucky, it gets to an overlook or some someplace else that that is meaningful. Um, I think a more, uh, of course, we know that the differently abled community is not homogenous. Uh, there's a variety of abilities and a variety of interest in how people want to experience the outdoors. So it seems to me that if that if we if we think about how we build our trails and with maybe a little bit of intentionality and a few tweaks that we can make more of our trails accessible and usable by more of our community. And to me, that that seems to be more in line with the tenets of uh, universal design, which say that uh, facilities should be usable by everyone with minimal, minimal adaptations. Uh, but I think really that the uh, you know, the community needs to be involved in, and engaged in those discussions in order for those things to happen. So maybe what's happening at the Network for Arizona Trails is the beginning of, of that kind of meaningful dialogue and participation. Uh, I'll just say in, in closing that I think it, it feels like it's part of a larger trend where we're, where we're more interested or more intentional about um, our outdoor spaces and our outdoor experiences being inclusive to everyone in the community and not not kind of the realm of a specific subset of the community. And I'll stop there, but thank you for your time. Martin, I really, I sincerely appreciate everything you do for our community. Um, I appreciate that voice. And I just want to say that we have another strong voice that um, I want to recognize. And 
part of the biking community and that is Lorena and um, I know Lorena that you have your hand up so please go ahead. Thanks Rachel yeah this question is for Martin. Um, I did go ahead and follow your link and it said that um, sales were closed for the event. Do you know if that means that no others can attend or was that specific for vendors that were participating? Um, just a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not sure, Lorraine. I'll. I'll find out for you. I was. I was. Um. I'm. I'm kind of trying to arrange my the rest of my week so I can go as well. So hopefully registration is not closed, or um, we're gonna have to crash it. Yeah, it says sales are sales are. Um, the exact words are, sales ended. Well, that's both a good and a bad thing, isn't it? <laughs> Correct. Um, really great. Thank you so much for putting this on our purview. And if you want to um, email me offline for any more info on that, I'd appreciate it. I think uh, Lorraine is going to be a really strong voice in our biking differently abled community. Oh, Russ, you. I do see your hand up. And Martin, thank you. Uh, this is a thank you to you, Martin, for responding to some of my concerns. Um, and you know, I, I walk on the Flagstaff Urban Trail just about every day. And uh, specifically in my neighborhood, um, when the city had replaced sidewalk and actually added sidewalk to where the trail intersects um, University Heights Drive South. And, and you know this because I contacted you about this, but the um, when the sidewalk was added to that intersection, um, they built a pad that is about 12 inches high. And then they put in a cutout, thankfully, that drops that pad down to the street. But on the other side of that pad that was added 12 inches of height to going up that hill to get to the street, that created a less accessible trail because people who use wheelchairs or have other mobility challenges um, will not be able to handle that incline. And um, again, it's kind of a project that's already done. And I'm not sure how to kind of rectify that inaccessibility, but um, nevertheless, it exists. And, I appreciate you actually responding to me about that. All right, Martin, do you do you have anything more to add? Lorena, do you? Uh, I I don't, Russell. I, I think um I mean we may have to go back after the fact and and, and see about uh, making that slope a little bit more gradual. But we can we can connect offline and try to figure okay. out. Okay, and Martin, I don't even really know how to check for. ADA accessibility, because I know trail accessibility is different than like other sidewalks, right? Uh, yes and no. In theory, no. It, it, there okay. are, you know, ADA standards for trails that apply to, that are, are not that different from sidewalks. I'll, I'll connect with you, Martin. Maybe we'll take a look at that together, because I, this is outside of my skill area, but <laughs> thanks, Martin. Okay, Russ, my only, my only requirement is that we don't do it over teams, that we actually <laughs> meet in the great in the out of doors uh, yes i think we will and bring your measuring equipment with you <laughs> fair enough all right uh i do have um i want to give a shout out to sarah and the exceptionally hard work that she did putting together the disability resource fair on october 5th i think that it was there were so many connections made and in the next few months we're going to see some of those people coming to this commission um we've got people wanting to start advocacy groups special olympics wants um some help from us with some of their stuff so sarah you did a smash up job um with that disability resource fair and i really look forward to you doing that or somebody doing that every year so Congratulations. Um, Sarah and Susan and I were interviewed by a gentleman named Mike Boland. He has a podcast called We Are All Stumped, and he talked about the Disability Resource Fair. He talked a little bit about our commission. So, um, and he's on YouTube, and I believe he's on Facebook as well. So, Sarah, Susan, everybody that was there, and every commissioner was there. It was amazing. So Sarah, you really did a great job. Thank you so, so much. It was a lot of fun um, and it looks like we will definitely be planning and doing it next year. So um, 
hopefully it'll build and be even bigger and better. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. It was great to have that support. And then Sarah, are you connected with the one that's happening in June in Phoenix? No, I, that's IHD. Um, I mean, I'm connected just because I'm on their um, CAC board, um, but they are, um, that's a great conference to go to. It has lots of different tracks and speakers. Um, statewide, it is down in the Valley, um, but kind of a different twist. It's not just focused only on resources. It's it's bigger than that, right? It's their state conference. So, but I highly encourage attendance. It was fantastic. June in the Valley is a no for me, but... I'd love to attend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything I, else between commissioners? Okay. We are to the portion where we normally would um, have agenda meetings or ask Stacy for agenda meetings for our November 27th meeting. But Stacy, it sounds like we're pretty full. Yeah, I thought I would just um, show you real quick the working calendar for next month. Um, so we'll have that appointment of the vice chair, but we also, like you had mentioned, we'll have Reggie here, um, as well as Chief Connolly, but we've also had a request, um, from our sustainability department, um, to talk about ADUs and their model pilot program, um, and the plans that are going to be developed for those, um, units. So she wanted to get some input from the commission, um, and then, Rachel, um, as requested, we've got a presentation from Michaela Sanders, who I believe you connected with at the Disability Resource Fair, along with Ryan Barry. Um, so th that is where we're at for next month. All right. Um, I think that we, does anybody want to say anything more about the agenda? No, it looks like Russ has his hand up. And I was, Rachel, I was just going to ask, so are we going to do something as a commission relative to connecting with Sarah Dector about the um, the Flagstaff Regional Plan? It yes. sounds like we're kind of on a tight schedule for that. Yes, what I would like to do is put together an informal working group today if I can and come up with a meeting time maybe by the end of this week or early next week. And then I will reach out to Sarah and find out if she can meet with our first meeting with anybody that wants to be on that. Keep in mind that I will be on it. It sounds like Russ will be on it. If we have more than three, we will need to post it as a notice of quorum. So I'll need to let Stacy know. Yeah, um, and I think if that subcommittee or informal working group will be, I think the best process for that is to, you know, go through your process, develop some recommendations if the commission as a whole wants to make a statement. So we we really should keep that at three. What I would encourage others that may want to participate, but can't just due to that quorum challenge. Um, as Sarah mentioned, you can certainly dive in individually, but um, you could certainly come prepared and, and add to that conversation when the informal working group comes back to share their thoughts. Okay. So one one other person that is a commissioner and then whoever else in the public would like to be part of that informal working group, uh, please email Stacy and I and I will try to put something together. Um, we'll do it via Zoom uh, and we can possibly do it er, this week or early next week so that we can come up with some recommendations and then meet with Sarah. Um, Sarah Dorman did put in the chat, I'm a coach for Special Olympics community based team for school aged athletes and unified par partners. Reach out if you know of someone that would be interested. So um, reach out to Sarah for Special Olympics stuff. And I think in January or February, the lady from Special Olympics that I met at the Disability Resource Fair will be coming in and talking for about 10 minutes. Um, Keith says, Stacy, can you email me a link to the working calendar? I would like to review it at times just to prep for future meetings. Stacy, right now that is open to vice chair and chair, right? I don't I don't think that it's open right now to any anyone. It's it's housed on my desktop. Um <laughs> uh, but I can I can email it to you. Um so you've got it. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. But I, I'm, I'm happy to email it out to the group. Uh, I, I know immediately the after. city council has theirs out there. 
Yes, that one is posted on um, I, I the that website. I yeah. fairly often. Yeah. yeah, you bet. I will email it out. Um, okay. I need to update the dates based on our action today, and then I'll send it out to the group. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. Stacy, is there any update on Renew Active at City Recreation Sites? Not yet, no. Okay. I'll check back in with the team. Okay. Anyone else? All right, well, we've squeezed a lot into a little of time. I sincerely appreciate all of you. Uh, at this point in time, we will adjourn the meeting and I will see all of you next week. I mean, next month. And please enjoy the fall. I love fall. So everybody enjoy this time. See you next month. Thank you. Good meeting, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.